All right, fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Christine May, and I am welcoming you today as an uninvited guest on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan people. As curator here at the Kelowna Art Gallery and on behalf of the Board of Directors and staff, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we operate, gather, and benefit every day on the land of the Seelix Okanagan Nation. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to have three panelists joining us for a discussion related to our current exhibition, The Street, uh, which was organized and circulated by the Vancouver Art Gallery and is curated by Grant Arnold, the O'Dain Curator of British Columbia Art. Uh, I will introduce each of these artists. First, I'll start with Christos Dikiakos, who was born in Greece and currently lives and works in Vancouver. Uh, he, his work investigates the topographical and historical through photography, and he is perhaps best known for his sites and place name series in Athens, Berlin, Saskatoon, and Vancouver, uh, which track significant cultural shifts and open discussions around ideological contexts. Uh, Christos obtained a BFA with honors in fine arts in 1972 at the University of British Columbia. Welcome. Uh, Hi. And next, <laughs> I'll introduce Lorraine. Welcome, Lorraine. Um, Lorraine Gilbert is a Canadian artist and photographer based in Ottawa, uh, who has been teaching for the past 25 years and is currently the director of visual arts uh, at the University of Ottawa. With an active exhibition record since 1980, her best known work is a seven year project called Shaping the New Forest on the subject of tree planters and clear cuts, mainly in BC. Uh, Lorraine studied environmental biology at McGill and forestry at UBC before embarking on a professional art career and obtaining a master's of fine arts at Concordia University. I'll introduce Jeffrey James, um, originally born in Wales and currently lives and works in Montreal. Um, he is a self-taught photographer and the author uh, of many uh, of books and monographs and is represented in major collections internationally. He has had solo shows across the globe, including a major retrospective exhibition at the National Gallery of Canada. Uh, Jeffrey is a Guggenheim Fellow uh, and has received the Governor General's Prize, the Governor General's Prize in Media and Visual Arts. So welcome, Jeffrey. We're very happy to have you all here tonight. Um, and before we get to the fun part, um, I'll remind everyone to please save your questions till the end. We'll have a 15 minute question and answer period um, when you can just type your question into the chat bar um, and we'll try to get to everyone's questions. Uh, and also important to note that today's lecture is going to be recorded and will be available for future viewing on our website. Okay, um, so now the best part, which we'll be hearing directly from the artists in our exhibition. Um, and I'll start, I think, by sharing my screen here and showing a couple exhibition uh, shots so that those of you who haven't been here in person kind of get a sense of the street. Uh, so I think we can have some of these photos up while we discuss. Um, and I think it would be great to go around to each of you if you could tell us a bit about how you got your start as an artist um, and if you always knew you would pursue a creative path. So maybe Christos, we could start with you. So did we, uh, did we want to become an artist right away? Well, you know, you want to become a fireman, a policeman, you know, whatever, you know, whatever a kid wants to be. But uh, when I went to uh, UBC, I, I was taking art history and uh, and then during those formative years, uh, I, I was very lucky to meet with uh, all sorts of new pals and colleagues that uh, got me interested in uh, becoming more or less a kind of a self-taught artist uh, at that time. And, um, and uh, being a, an avid kind of reader and follower of contemporary art trends. And one of those particular contemporary art trends had to do with photography, uh, especially in conceptual art. Um, and, um, and, and also at the same time, you know, it, it wasn't just me, you know, I, I was very, very fortunate to have uh, fabulous mentors, uh, uh, the modernists uh, that, that were here in BC that uh, really took an interest in a lot of young, uh, you know, young people, and also kind of young people on the go. And with their encouragement and also with their help and also with the kind of milieu, uh, things just became what they became. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. And Lorraine, how about you? How did you get your start as an artist? Well, it was a, a little bit late only because I never thought I, I could ever be one. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I studied uh, environmental biology, like you said before. And it was when I came to BC to study forestry, I did, so I was enrolled in a master in a master's in forestry that I realized that um, I would have to work with all these people in my classes, which was at the time in 1978, a lot of boys. And um, mm -hmm. I, I just realized I couldn't do that. And so I happened to take one, a course in Banff, just at the time when the Banff Center was going from uh, diploma style uh, mm -hmm. courses to the artist residencies. And, um, and uh, then I then I couldn't go back to the forestry department. I mean, I did for about a semester. And there were these beautiful pictures in the department. That was one thing that photographs by uh, by that the turn of the century uh, logger photographer. Oh God, I keep forgetting names these days. <laughs> um, anyway, Darius Kinsey. Yes. Beautiful, large yes. Darius Kinsey pictures yes. that yes. just fascinated me. And there was a little dark room also in the master's uh, in the forestry building. And I was always there adding pictures to my research all the time. And so um, I was Vancouver was new to me as well. And it was so beautiful and different. And I couldn't believe where I was that the picture that you have in this show mm -hmm. is of that first series of works when um, when I was discovering Vancouver. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how it began for me. Yeah, a different route, but very interesting. Thank you. And Jeffrey, I'm so glad now to be able to hear your voice, if you wouldn't mind telling us how you got your start as an artist. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm even later than Lorraine. I mean, when I was a teenager, I mean, photography, it never entered my mind. I, I wanted to be a jazz musician, but I you realize very quickly that that takes enormous talent, you know. Um, and uh, university, I, I studied history, but I did journalism. I really enjoyed writing. Um, and uh, and I, I, my last year there, I edited the university magazine and, you know, we, actually published photographs. I had a kind of low grade interest and it wasn't until I, I got a job after graduating in Philadelphia. And it was such a, the whole environment was such a, it was so strange to me that I got interested in it. And I used to go down my days off with Thursday and I would go to New York City to the Museum of Modern Art and this little room with tatty carpets where they had the permanent collection of photography because none of the, the press photographers at my newspaper couldn't tell me who the good photographers were so in a funny way i backed into it through the history and then i moved to montreal in 66 i was working for time magazine and i got to meet the most wonderful people charles daniel um sam tatter um many many photographers and then even Andre Cortez, who I met in New York in 68, we became big friends. Uh, he would give me a print every time I visited him. <laughs> and I, had, I had Jacques Henri Lartigue, the boyhood photographer, as a house guest in, in Montreal, because Bill Ewing, who was doing a show, couldn't afford a hotel. And I, in, in those days, very middle class. I'm middle class again, I'm happy to say. So what I'm saying is, and then I worked at the, after that, the Canada Council with no qualifications, whatever. But, but being at the council taught me that a grown up could be an artist. You know, I, I also looked at the juries and saw people sending in the same pictures every, every, every year. And I thought, oh, I can do more than I can do different ones. Yeah. <laughs> so I left at age 40. And my mother said, Jeffrey, you're 40, you don't have a job, which was absolutely right. Anyway, but <laughs> ever since then, it's all I've done. Um, but I've been very lucky because I it actually was completely irrational. Um, but I just did it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, I mean, you you may have touched on this slightly, but why uh, for all of you this interest in photography as opposed to other mediums, or have you also explored other mediums in your practice? Um, we can go back to you, Christos, if you want to talk about that. Well, yeah, I, you know, the, 
the the foundational kind of uh, teachers uh, that uh, we had uh, in terms of uh, any kind of studio programs that we would take would be painters and late modernists. And by the late 60s, modernism seemed to have kind of had its due course. And the idea of, for me, being a studio artist just didn't, it wasn't very interesting. Uh, it was also, uh, uh, there was a very different avant-garde there. Um, and I thought that perhaps the world was a kind of an open studio. So which better way to see it is with the camera um, and to, to engage, uh, you know, to engage with it. Um, although my first camera was an Agfa, uh, Ansco Agfa uh, kind of a camera, you know, the ones that had a kind of selenium uh, little uh, light meter, and then you'd kind of uh, uh, put one over the other and make sure you're on the right exposure, kind of semi-automatic. And I bought that uh, during high school when I was going to uh, take a trip to see an old pal who lived up in the Caribou, which like in the early 60s, it was fascinating, you know, to, to take something, record your trip, and then bring it back. And then again, after high school, going uh, to uh, to the uh, to Montreal and getting a better camera um, and, and, and photographing uh, the World's Fair, being in Montreal for a month. So it was a kind of, a, uh, it was almost kind of documenting my travels, you know, for that first, uh, first little while, you know, what cameras meant to me. There were like these personal kind of, recordings. Um, so I was very happy. I was delighted to to do that than actually, you know, be a studio artist. Mm -hmm. And when you were doing your BFA, did you ever consider exploring other mediums at the time? Uh, no, not really. I, you know, I, I was doing all sorts of things. Um, uh, of course, uh, we're also do, uh, doing curating uh, with, with other uh, fellow students. We had uh, uh, new facilities at the university that we could take over like student union building galleries. We also had uh, prominent uh, curators like Lucy Lepard coming to town and kind of having conversations with her and also with Doris Shadbolt. There was also Alvin Balkine who were always very encouraging to allow us to uh, perhaps, uh, you know, do our own exhibitions mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, and in some cases with our own photographs and also inviting other people. So right. it was a, you know, it was a very interesting, kind of didn't know what you really wanted to be, you know, yeah. did you really want to be a photographer or were you going to be a curator or just a, a student forever, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All good options, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, Lorraine, same question to you. If you, um, why you chose photography uh, as opposed to other mediums? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I didn't even, you know, I didn't know anything about art. My, my parents did have a, a reproduction of a Mondrian with some beautiful colors and I loved it. Uh, that was about as much as I knew. And uh, high school, no good art teachers really. I, I didn't even, but my father was a, um, an amateur photographer. So, you know, he, he loved it so much and he was a, a technician, like what he would buy a, a lens and then he would test the lens endlessly. And, you know, that was about it and, you know, and so um, I was encouraged by him. So he, he kind of loaned me his camera and said, I'll, I'll buy the film if you, I'll buy the film and have it developed if you want. So that's when I started, mm -hmm. but I didn't think that it was art. I just thought photography is photography. It's not, you know, so I didn't even think about it as something I could do, actually do. Mm -hmm. um, it was only, you know, when I, I was already, at UBC studying forestry that that I realized okay I got to do something fun mm -hmm. if I'm gonna have to work with these people in my life um 
you know, to make my living. And it was then that I was turned around to saying, oh my God, this is like, it's actually, it's actually art. Yes. <laughs> and people do this and I could actually do this. Oh, I, I was just thrilled to death. Yeah. And so, um, so it started there. And, mm -hmm. um, and then of course I got to, my, my father bought a, a, a Linhof te Technica in Germany at the time of my birth. And so, and then he tested all the lenses <laughs> endlessly again. So I actually got that camera eventually. So I was, you know, that was, that was the camera that I've always used. And um, at least when I did large format. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I was lucky in that sense. And then I learned about art afterwards. So I yeah. started taking pictures and, and people were interested. Um, Bill Jeffries at his gallery in Vancouver, uh, it was called the Coburg. Um, he gave me my first show in a, a real gallery and, mm -hmm. and it was this night work. It was the night work. Um, yeah. So it just really all happened at once. Yeah. I mean, I, I made my own little color dark room because by the time I left Banff, I had to, how am I going to do it? So I actually made my own dark room uh, with color film, like, you know, like developing color and printing color and, and a little thing the walls were made of black plastic <laughs> to keep the light out. And wow. Where there's a will, there's a way. That's right. I mean, yeah. I was hooked. definitely. Yeah. Hooked. That's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, and Jeffrey, we'd love to know as well, why you chose photography over other mediums, or if you've explored other mediums throughout your career. Well, um, no, I haven't. I, I still play the trumpet, but um, yeah, not good enough. <laughs> um, thing is, I think I think what I did was um, from the very beginning. I kind of backed into it through through history. I bought every book I could, and it's very it's very hard to convey how little information there was in the sixties. You know, um, it was a little tiny world. Um, and everybody knew everybody. And, and I was very lucky because I got to meet all sorts of people. But in Montreal, when I was there, I, I, I even taught a seminar in the history of photography at what became uh, Concordia, Sir George Williams. Mm -hmm. and, and the curator in that, he saw my pictures and he said, would you like to have a show? I, I, I was completely blown away. I had 1971. You know, I think I was, I don't know what I was, I was very young. And um, so I did this show and it was after doing group journalism with Time magazine, which was very intense, but um, suddenly having all these pictures on the wall, it felt so pure. It was mine, you know, yeah. and, um, and all kinds of people came because I knew everybody, you know, because Mordecai Richler came to my opening and Michel Bro, and anyway, anyway, some, it was great. But most important, I got to meet um, Michiko Yajima, uh, who was married to Charles Daniel, who became kind of my best friend. Um, and she started a gallery in the 70s. And she actually put me in the first show. It was, it was such an act of faith. I, I felt that I had to become a photographer. You know, her gallery, people probably don't know anymore, but she showed and was really close to people like Robert Frank, uh, Lee Friedlander, Manuel Alvarez, Alvarez Bravo, but she also showed Sherry Levine and Barbara Kruger. Mm -hmm. this, I don't think there's ever been a gallery like this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, she, and she, she ended up, I said, you'll never make any money, but you're gonna make, you're gonna have a great collection. It's just too, absolutely true. Um, yeah. She has 10 perfect Robert Franks, which she swapped because Robert needed wheels. So, so he got a Land Rover and he got, she got the best 10 photographs from the Americans. Okay, wow. so that's my story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, each of your individual practices, uh, have a real focus on the landscape and in our exhibition, the street, um, that's evident. And I'm wondering, uh, if you can talk about the landscape, um, Lorraine, of course, with your background, that seemed to be a, a kind of a natural interest. Um, but I'd love to hear from all of you why the land, uh, why the interest in the land as subject matter. Um, so I'll, I'll go around again to you, Christos, if you wouldn't mind speaking about some of your work, which I can pull up on the screen here. Yeah.
Well, you know, these are probably the most uh, unusual examples of street photography that you'll ever see. I mean, first of all, uh, it's a panorama format. So who goes around with a big panorama camera to take street photography? A. Second, <clears throat> oh, gee, there's words on pictures. You know, I thought pictures are, are supposed to be you know, are worth a thousand words. So, 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 so this kind of uh, hybrid kind of way of of looking at uh, or 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 talking about this as street photography uh, is interesting. But again, you know, the curator wants to show as many possible examples and to kind of bring in uh, all the kind of hybrid forms and also the classic forms of what street photography is, which to my mind is always like capturing the life of, of the city uh, in a kind of a candid way as you're, especially if you're on the sidewalk and if you're in the street. These particular pictures uh, come from um, uh, a body of work <clears throat> that uh, deals with um, uh, kind of strategies of recuperating, recuperative strategies of trying to recuperate, let's say, uh, not so much lost histories, but histories that were never taught to me as a non-native person. Uh, and, and, and also at a time when uh, this particular city, like a lot of cities in North America, were going to uh, you know, going to get a, their 100th or 200th kind of anniversary of being Vancouver. But as we know, there were at least 40 or different names, sites and place names, names within Vancouver from uh, First Nations uh, Salish uh, um, uh, communities that are still here. Um, and the other thing was that I, 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 I'm photographing this from the street. This is False Creek. Uh, it's, it's going through huge radical shape-shifting changes. Uh, the place is being dug up. Uh, it's after a World's Fair where you can see that kind of, uh, uh, on the second picture, there's a tower and then there's a kind of a geodesic dome. And then there's, in the foreground, there's all this kind of garbage and uh, collection of stuff, which was a recycling area. Um, and I'm and I'm thinking to myself, well, here it is right now, and in a matter of a year, this will all shape shift into something else, and that's exactly mm -hmm. what's happened to False Creek. Then this became the Olympic Village, mm -hmm. and now it's like this brand new neighborhood. Um, and and at the same time, I also wanted to make a few comments of what was here. What was the ecology like? Uh, what, uh, you know, what was in this particular area? Did it all get filled in? So the fact that you have sold sturgeon ducks, well, guess what? The ducks have come back. There is uh, uh, sea life uh, and crabs and whatever, because that whole area of Falls Creek is all being kind of cleaned up. So the idea that this kind of became a start of a recuperative, um, you know, trying to know about where you are and, and how you navigate uh, 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 this place became a very interesting project for me where I really spent a lot of time. Uh, I did a lot of interviews. I was given uh, permission uh, by uh, the local bands. And, uh, and in a way, I guess it is street pictures because I'm, I'm actually walking along 2nd Avenue and shooting this. Uh, this area, which was called Hole and Bottom, and the reason it was called Hole and Bottom was because there were huge kind of underground springs that would well up with fresh water. Uh, and but on the other hand, Hole and Bottom here meant like you know you you hit the bottom. <laughs> this is it, right? The only way is probably up. <laughs> uh, so that's that's kind of a. a you know, I, I kind of a brief explanation of, of what's happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with <clears throat> sandblasted text, uh, which would uh, cast shadows on the picture, uh, if you noticed it. So they're kind of like windows into um, looking into a kind of a present condition. But there's other things that you've been told with the certainty of text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I know a lot of people who visit our exhibition are really drawn to these two pieces. They're in quite a prominent place. And I think the text on them, as you say, they cast these shadows, uh, gives this real layered um, kind of meaning to it. So uh, thank you for explaining it to us. Um, and Lorraine, why don't I pull up some of your images here as well? And you can speak a bit about your approach to street photography and your interest in, in the land as subject matter. And here we go. Nice. Well, it, it, the, this, I mean, this, this work is so early in my own trajectory in photography that uh, it's almost embarrassing, <laughs> but um, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But it was, you know, I, I, I was just, just having so much fun. And I realized that um, uh, Vancouver itself was, I mean, I wasn't photographing the land. I was photographing this city that was new to me. And, uh, I, and I always do make a distinction between landscape and cityscape. And so I think maybe my work was a little more cityscape-ish, which is what I would think about Christos's work as well that I remember, by the way, I remember the first time I saw that work, it was, I was really impressed with that work. Um, so, so this would have been, say, the second body of work. The first one was, were little gardens with 35 millimeter camera. Uh, just, I wanted to see what would happen if you push the exposures and the colors go crazy. And it, it made it Vancouver even more interesting than I already thought it was. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I could share that with, people by making those pictures. And then the next iteration of, of that work um, was people. And so, and I did see them as film stills because there was life going on. There was things going on in this place that is to me so beautifully magical. And so um, I would with, usually with friends or going to somewhere, party, whatever it is, I would you know say, oh, uh, would you mind standing there for a minute and then I'd get my tripod and I would just do it and so oh. I I made not that many but uh, there was a little group of film still-ish photographs and they were done with my brand new uh, medium format camera the Makina and that was uh, I was already a tree planter by then because I had to make money and so I at one point I just said okay every tree I plant in this in the next month is going to a camera so just work my but work your butt off and get a really good camera and, and the makina was oh, so expensive at the time and i just bought it and um so um so this is a just a friend who's still a friend of mine and i couldn't help but you know with the angels fly because they take themselves lightly and this friend of mine who's dressed in all in red and his his red you know shorts and we were going dancing and that was his dancing clothes and um um, so much later, and I guess that's what I, I, I sent you a, like, so this would have been in 2018. So I, I love going back to Vancouver as much as I can. And, yeah. um, in 2018, I just asked my friend, cause would you mind going to the place and doing that picture again? And I didn't even know where it was. I was, where exactly is it? And he knew precisely where it was, and sure enough. And as it happens, the, there's a new building there on the left side, above where the, the person is standing, which is uh, where uh, other artists that I know live, Jay Saloom being one mm -hmm. of them. Um, anyway, so, I mean, things had changed so much and it was so amazing just to see. And then, you know, so the, the, this thing about, well, photography and time is such an important yeah. Thing, and I'm, I'm getting to play with it in that way. However, I have to say that in 2015, I had a, a sabbatical leave and I went to Vancouver and I did some street shooting uh, and it was very different. It's not at night. It's not, there's, you know, it's not so much about people that, you know, anyway, so I'm still interested, but I'm more interested in Vancouver mm -hmm. than street shooting. The cityscape, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just find it an amazing <clears throat> and it's changing in ways that are so sad but in, and important, you know. So, 
um, yeah, anyway, I guess that's how I would talk about it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey, would you like me to pull up some of your photos as well? And you can talk about um, kind of your focus on, on the street or the landscape um, as subject matter. Maybe we'll start here. Oh, this sorry. is the uh, image of yours that we have in our show. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, the, as you can see, they're very different. Um, yeah. In a way, I'm a bit resistant to the whole the whole idea of genre, of putting a heading on something, and because I think I think it's often a way of not paying attention. You know, mm. it's, for example, you know, car radio. When if you're switching on a car radio, the music. The moment you hit the music, you can put it in a niche, like in a, a nanosecond. So, but you, it's very unusual that anything. What is that? And I, I think that's the whole you know, effect of, of um, genre. Okay, so, and I'm, this picture is, is part of a failed project. Um, mm -hmm. Well failed, I would say unfinished, but I will never finish it. I, I, when, I, when I moved to Toronto in the nineties, I had a bit like Philadelphia. <clears throat> I had a lot of trouble adapting to it physically. So it's a strange city. Um, it's got some nice aspects. It's a very difficult place to seize. It's very spread out and amorphous and anyway. And so I did a book um, on Toronto um, with the help of Scott McIntyre, a publisher who actually you know, commissioned books. But in doing it, I realized that probably the most interesting story is not the city of Toronto and its strange development, um, but the stuff that goes on around it, the so-called 905 region, which mm -hmm. I see as a series of compound errors you know, I mean, until we, two thirds of the grade A arable land in Canada is visible from the CN Tower, the Holland Marsh, you know, and it's all being incredibly rich soil. It's all being settled in the most insanely wasteful way, one mistake after another. And I thought, and I, I would, you know, try and deal with it. And this is one of the pictures I took. Um, it's an interesting picture because um, it also, when I took it, I said, this is really weird. It's, it reminds me of a city, a painting, which is in Urbino called The Ideal City. Nobody knows who painted it, probably a man called Loredano. It's one of the strangest paintings. Anyway, I just thought the space was so weird. Um, I also learned in this project, photographing suburbs, houses are much more interesting before they're finished. Mm. Yeah, anyway, yeah. But yeah, but the other ones I took, which you flashed by, mm -hmm. are pictures that I've been working on for quite a few years. These are very much street photographs. They're dealing with flux. And um, it's part of a project I had. This is Vancouver. Um, this is a, I thought it was a wedding, but it's in fact a high school um, oh. uh, prom on Barad. Yeah. Um, very, very sophisticated ladies. I was going to say young ladies. They look incredibly grown up. Um, what's, what's the next one? Um, is, that, is that what? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is um, Montreal. <clears throat> I don't know if this will make any sense, but um, I sent that picture to Peggy Gale to show to Michael Snow <laughs> because of the figure on the left. <laughs> and, and Peggy said, he didn't say much, but he, he looked at it for a long time. <laughs> anyway, walking woman, for those who don't know. <laughs> and that woman was absolutely mesmerizing. And when I saw her, I followed her for about a block. She was, it was like uh, the Michael Snow, you know, animated. It was astonishing. Um, yeah, so that's that's part of what I've been doing. It's it's a kind of a, a giant thank you to Canada, but, but, but always with a hook in it, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, so, I've also, at the same time, I've, I've taken thousands of pictures from train windows right across the country. Um, a very, very strange project. And I think I have something that might be us usable, but it's, 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 it's what I do. It's like, I'm like a, a worm. It's, I just process the world through my camera and you know, whatever. So yeah, so mm -hmm. working. Thank you so much for that. I'll stop sharing for the time being here. Um, 
Fantastic to have some images to talk about though in detail. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, with our exhibition, uh, placing its focus on the street, how much, if any, of your photographic uh, practice has explored street photography as a theme? And I think we really touched on that um, and that you also don't want to be, you know, necessarily pigeonholed into street photography. Sure. Um, but uh, is that kind of how, how you would say you're exploring your or what your focus is now at this stage in your career? Mm -hmm. Okay, street wow. photography and i'll start with you christos uh, i think i think it's location scouting for me yeah. it always has been it's like you're you're kind of fascinated by how this place is changing and then that fascination really uh starts to be uh a kind of uh you know fr from what the experiences that we had and i think jeffrey and Lorraine have talked about all these vast kind of like transformative changes. Do you really, you wonder if it's for the better? Mm -hmm. You know, we have density, density shoved down our throats. People are talking about affordability. And of course, nothing is affordable with the density that we're getting here in Vancouver. Uh, and we're, and I'm just wondering uh, where are uh new families where are where is the working class uh where are the new artists we, you know wh where where are they going to be i mean we i was very fortunate to have studios and big spaces once upon a time um so that location scouting uh over a period of time um has you know i i, I still keep looking at it and i and i also look for these kind of um Kind of maybe these kind of contradictions in terms of what you see in the foreground and then what you see in the background mm -hmm. uh, uh, make interesting pictures, uh, make interesting uh, narratives. So maybe the foreground's kind of messy and disheveled, doesn't look promising, but oh well, here we go. We've got a you know beautiful fluffy clouds going by, and we have this kind of like. Uh, city of uh high atops which looks like capital capitalist you know picturesque and the mountains and and so <laughs> there's these kind yeah. of stories going back and forth um that you can actually maybe encapsulate and one you, you know in one picture mm -hmm. uh i like when when that happens uh i'm not sure when that happens i mean you had a question there earlier what's the perfect picture well the perfect picture is after you after you printed it and you're and you're enjoying it. You know, in the old days, you you do the perfect picture, you'd hang in the wall, you'd light up a cigarette, and you'd kind of look at it. And then after the smoke kind of blows away, you're either going to say, "Oh, I think that's good," or else it wasn't going to be any good. <laughs> that's what we're allowed to smoke at studios. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the the smoke and the smoke screen. Uh, and after the fact was, oh, it is good. No, it's not any good, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk more about the process yeah. of getting the, the perfect picture in a moment, yeah. too. Um, mm -hmm. And what about you, Lorraine? Um, this this focus as a you know on the street as a, a subject for your photography um that's in your newer series as well right walking through the street daytime and nighttime and capturing moments on the street if you wouldn't mind speaking about what you're working on now yes yes i mean i'm i'm continuously working on the other you know projects that have to do with the forest and plants mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. landscape of that nature uh, that's ongoing as well, but um, I'm very interested in continuing something that I didn't, I mean, I did it at the very beginning by, you know, but I, I didn't see it as street photography in any way. And I don't know what it was because in fact, I mean, I'm reading this book now, Planeuse, uh, which is, you know, after all these years, I find a book by a woman about this, this whole idea. And, um, and, and I realize how I, I never, uh, you know, I never, I never indulged in that way, or I never consciously did. And it's, I feel like I'm, I'm getting a, a bit of a new freedom simply by realizing how 
Right. This, I mean, I used to photograph at night with the tripod sitting there waiting for the uh, exposure to happen. And, and it was probably dangerous, but um, I was yet too young to, to think about it. You know, I was having too much fun, but um, I'm very interested in continuing both, both avenues of photographing. And I think that in terms of um, street photography, for me, it's very much more cityscape. And cityscape means how a city is changing, how it, how it, um, how do people, how can people live within this kind of thing? There are always some people here and there, uh, but yet I don't want to be the, the, the big sneak, you know, mm -hmm. either. Or the, so I think um, I, I've, I went to Japan recently, well, it was 2020, just before I went to Vancouver and saw Christos. Um, and I got lost in Tokyo by myself. And I I didn't know how to work my phone. I didn't have the right thing for the, the maps. So I, wow, it was incredible. And I, I took a lot of pictures with my phone. And I'm realizing now that, um, uh, wow, I would just love to go back to a city like that. Mm -hmm. And get lost in it and learn something about it, learn something different about it. So I will, you know, continue doing it. And um, I think that I, uh, the importance of it, who knows, but it's, uh, it's something that keeps the discovery of, of the world through right. taking pictures. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and Jeffrey, same to you. I, I know you wouldn't call yourself a street photography or a street photographer uh, specifically, um, but in some of the photos that you recently sent me, it looks like you're capturing all sorts of activity on the street. So is there something specific that you're drawn to um, with what's happening on, on the street right now? Not, no, not as such. I mean, um, in a way, the Canadian photographs are more about urban space and how we use them. I do have a, a project which I've been engaged on for a few years, which is kind of unusual. Um, in 2013, I read that the Kingston Penitentiary was closing mm -hmm. and I managed to worm my way in um, using various false fronts um, until I got, we got permission from the Privy Council to take pictures there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and it was a very, um, very difficult experience or traumatic in a way. Uh, and I was totally bummed out at the end of it. And very little, um, I don't know, it's just, it was very hard uh, to do, but I did it. I did the book and I and I figured, you know, it, it, I, I got it done because it, it's gone. If you, once the place is empty, it just becomes a romantic ruin. So, uh, but I, I said, I've got to do something beautiful now. And I had a friend who told me about a wonderful um, Slovenian um, uh, architect who worked in the 30s mainly. Um, anyway, he worked in Prague and Vienna um, and then at the capital of Slovenia, Ljubljana. So I, I went over there and I was completely blown away. So what I've been trying to do is I'm trying to do a book that is an, it's, it's kind of architectural photography, but that is another, that's a really dead genre. I don't think it's changed since 1839 or whatever, but, but um, not really. Um, so I, it's all, I photographed it all handheld with a, a, a digital black and white Leica. And the thing is the city is so successful um, socially that I just, took hundreds, whatever, many, many pictures of people in the spaces. Mm -hmm. Also at night, the cameras are so good now, you don't need a tripod or even a tripod. <laughs> I photograph everything and they're beautiful. So this is great, you know. Um, so, so in fact, and I'm very engaged with it. And I, I actually love street photography and I think, it, but I think it's incredibly hard. I, I just, I just, you watch somebody, look at somebody like Gary Winogrand who kind of, one of the inventors really of the whole mode of, and how he just wore himself out, you know? I mean, it's so hard. There's this wonderful um, uh, Norwegian, Trans Troma, he got the poet, um, he got the Nobel Prize. He talked in one of his poems about the world being used up. Mm. And um, I, I, I'm getting that feeling, but I love the iPhone incidentally. I think it's a brilliant camera and I'd be very happy if it's the only camera I had, I, I would do stuff with it. Wow. Mm -hmm. It takes Over a good picture. 
Yeah. We're all lucky to have an iPhone in our pocket then. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and that yeah. kind of brings us to um, thinking about <clears throat> new technologies or, or ways yeah. of, of being a photographer. Um, and if you can each speak a bit about um, the role that tech, new technology has played in your practice um, and maybe even a bit about your photographic process. So if you, you start with an idea um, and to work your way up, or are you just walking down the street spontaneously and an idea comes to you? Um, these kinds of new ways of, of being a photographer, if you wouldn't mind um, bringing us up to speed. Christos, we can start with yeah. you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to, to say something previous because I forgot to mention it because I'm always seen as the Vancouver guy. Yeah. But, you know, I where I really take street pictures is when I when I leave Vancouver and mm -hmm. I'm thinking you know like with Berlin I did a huge project on Athens and then when I went to the city that I was born uh, in Thessaloniki which is like a big uh, port city it has an amazing uh, history from Roman Greek uh, Jewish city um, I went uh, in 1971 to see our old house and it was there it was like derelict whatever and then when I went there in 2000 and I was in the middle of a street market uh, where people were selling fish and somebody was buying vegetables and the house was somewhere there it was it was evaporated it was in the street so it really gave me a whole kind of uh, uh, how shall I say the fact that this was the house and now people are going through it, it was mm -hmm. actually uh, quite an amazing feeling. And I, and I had problems trying to figure out, well, well, it's an experience now, it's not even a picture. But the question that you bring up is very, very interesting question about photography. And photography, you know, is in a way, I mean, in the, the most stable thing that you can have in photography is film, is the negative. You know, as long as you mm. keep that negative in a really good place and a nice dry uh, uh, safe, you know, fireproof safe, it should last for quite a while. But since uh, we don't really shoot negatives anymore, and I mean, who's got a dark room anymore? I mean, all my pals have yanked out all their, you know, maybe there's one in the university uh, or, or, or at the art school, you know, a decent one. So we're constantly going from one to the other to the other to kind of save, you know, whatever files we have. So we, you know, we had it on, you know, we, we had them on this, right? And then we have it on hard drive, but then we don't know how long it's going to last in the hard drive. And it just keeps going and going. And now I have five of these these are like portable ssds you know so i've got five of these because i don't even know if you'll be able to retrieve this stuff so i've got one i've got you know uh my photography lab has another uh my assistant has another one so it's a constant kind of shift because it doesn't really matter from what i hear from you know a lot of people that do this stuff and also from technicians the minute you make that photograph whether it's inkjet archival paper it's up in the wall um it's it's all it's starting to degenerate in one way or the other um i have friends that keep huge amounts of film in coolers uh or uh photographs in coolers so it's a you know it's it's, it's amazing because as the technology changes, you kind of keep up with it. Yeah. In a way, in a way it's a wonderful educational experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and not to get kind of hung up on, about it. And I, and I also uh, admire what uh, Jeffrey said, that this thing here is the most amazing, uh, ubiquitous kind of thing that has happened to us. You know, you would take the picture, it's stored up in an iCloud somewhere. When we wanted to get it back, we can get it back. I mean, it's 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 great. It sure yeah. makes things easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Lorraine, we'll move on to you as well. How has new technology impacted your art yeah. practice? 
Um, well, for me, it was uh, it was in the it was in the '90s, like most people, I suppose, and um, lots of um, purists were oh digital <laughs> stuff and no 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 no, and it was all going to be. And my father, of course, the ultimate uh, technician and lover of photography, was thrilled. He got himself a little a Nikon, uh, the first one, you know, mm -hmm. cool or something. And he, and he, you know, said, you got to try my camera, Lorraine, you got to try my camera. And I'd say, oh, I that, whatever, I'm okay. When I, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't. And then the day that I did, he, it was, it was the end of the day. The sun was going down. It was in the, there was in a garden with, you know, the lights. Oh my God. It was, and there was my picture being formed in front of my very eyes. And I didn't have to wait for, yeah. you know, for whatever. And I, I was hooked mm -hmm. immediately. And so I call myself a born again photographer at the, you know, at that time, this is already over 20 years ago. Um, and so I just did everything again in digital and just tried all kinds of, you know, lots of um, creating images and cutting them up in Photoshop and reprinting them. And so it was really, I, I started to, not take photographs, which I've never really liked that word anyway. It's always making photographs, no matter what, but mm -hmm. really making photographs by, you know, it wasn't, it was never a single shot. Like I stopped doing the single shots of there's a picture and started making pictures. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, you know, I was very thrilled with all this. And here I am, I'm a prof as well. So I, I teach photography and I'm, mm -hmm. And what the, the the most interesting thing these days is is how the young people just want to do analog. Like mm. they're just, you know, that's that's what they want to do. <laughs> so I was like really close to saying, we don't need our dark rooms anymore. Yeah. But then somebody said, Well, maybe we should, you know, this is an art school after all. And so yeah, we did. Thank God we did, because um that's where really interesting work is <laughs> happening now. It's yeah. young people doing uh, using the materials. That's so, so great. Yeah, it's really great, and uh, and I'm learning from them. I'm learning now. You know, like I'm again uh, to to love different aspects of photography or to discover them mm -hmm. from all my students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, Jeffrey, I know you're a fan of the iPhone, um, and so I'm sure your practice has evolved over time, but how are you embracing new technology, and um, how is that influencing you now? I'm embracing it passionately. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I was about as old-fashioned. I was going to bring this in when um, Chris was talking about his camera. I rushed back to my little studio. I mean, my wife's studio. This was the, this was the camera that got me into Let's the world. Let's see. Oh it's wow! A, um, and it, you, you, it's like a rabbit. You get the rabbit. And it, yeah. I could open it up, and this, the film is on a curve, and had to be done with a changing bag. I mean, there was no exposure control. That was my camera for ten years. Yeah. I mean, Looking ridiculous. Around. And but then, and then I got very good cameras, big view cameras, and and modern panoramic cameras, and blah blah blah. And then I waited until the. I thought the digital technology became mature and I bought these the beautiful, the first really good digital Leica. And then the printers are so good. And then it gets more interesting because what I have discovered, it's really very, um, is that um, it, it's allowed me, I'm very much concerned with the notion of the archive, you know, as you get older and what are you gonna do with it? And I've been revisiting, scanning the, all these negatives. I just scanned 660 eight by 10 negatives of the work of Frederick Law Olmsted. And there's a curator coming up from America to look at them. So I'm gonna be working all night on this. Wow. What I've discovered is, it's really interesting, is that I actually like digital printing much better than mm. silver printing. It allows for much finer control, um, very, uh, no smelly acetic acid, um, no fingerprints, you know, the next day it's show up, no creasing when you're drying them. It's, it's painless, you can deal with the image. And so I make hundreds and hundreds of prints, but I, you know, they're not, they're, they're pretty permanent. Um, 
And the other way, and I, I totally think Chris is absolutely right. You know, the word migrate has become a transitive verb. Now you migrate something from one format to another. It's gonna never, it's never gonna stop. So, you know, and it's, it has all kinds of really quite negative uh, possibilities and impacts. But um, I, I, I just think we have to, you know, I do books still. I believe in books and I believe in prints. I'm trying to get work into museums um, so that it's gonna be there looked after by somebody. I just got 40 prints to Paris into the Musée Carnavalet there. Mm -hmm where I can lie in state with Urge and Ache, you know? I just really, it's a good feeling. It makes me feel better, you know, <laughs> uh, this stuff. So get it looked after. And, and it's, a, it's a huge problem for a photographer's archives. Not many yeah. people will take them, actually. It's mm -hmm. a huge responsibility and an expense. Um, it's a big issue, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, so, so that's... Yeah. Hearing the benefits of digital then kind of across the board. Yeah. No, I, no yeah, I'm, I'm totally positive about it. I, I wish, I wish I'd had it. I could have done so much more, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, well, I think it's a good time. It's seven o'clock. So why don't I open it up to any questions that people may have? So you can enter it into the chat um, and I can read them out to the artists. So I'll give everybody a moment. Uh, and in the meantime, um, I will ask one fun question. Uh, what is the longest time you've ever spent waiting for that perfect shot? So speaking of the perfect photo or what we would consider the perfect photo, um, what was, do, do any of you have, have stories of the process or the waiting for that perfect shot? I've got one. Okay. Let's so, hear it. Yeah. Well, it's not so much waiting. It's just how, how ridiculous, this ridiculous machine, it, it used to have roll film, um, and uh, you, you anyway. It used to have, I think it had two speeds. It only had one speed anyway. But so I, I think it was always done on a tripod. I figured that if, if and it would only work well in one direction. It, it would scan unevenly went back. So I had this. I had, I had repair guys in London, New York, and Rome, and the guy in Rome spent a whole day with it. Signor Zauli. And he fixed it so that it would go back and forth. And I was living outside uh, Rome on the Via Cassia in the ancient capital of Etruria, um, Isola Farnese. And it was, it was these Etruscan roads. It was a strange place. And there was one road there. And I always wanted a photograph. There was never enough, enough light. So this time the camera was working. I set it up. I flipped it one way very carefully cocked it, flipped it back, did it five times, and it's glorious, you know, I mean, it was just, it was, I would never, I'm so happy, but in a way, I have never sort of waited for a picture, I mean, with this camera, I can only take about seven or eight pictures a day, you have to sit on the ground with a big changing bag and put the film and take it out in a three little, you saw the picture, just that's what the waiting was. I found a lot of pictures sitting on the ground, looking around. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that story. Always appreciate it. Um, okay, we have a couple questions in the chat that I'll read out. Um, one says, thank you for the wonderful discussion this evening. Uh, it is inspiring to hear a bit about your lengthy and insightful careers. The concept of change has been a common theme tonight. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for the next generation of photographers. That's a great question. Um, who may not be able to benefit from the perspective that time has given all of you? Uh, the medium of photography has changed immensely, particularly over the past decade. So what strategies for making images and sharing our work today might hold the power to be lasting? Wonderful question. Wow. Ooh, tough one. Do you want to jump in, Lorraine? Or um, well, because I'm teaching, that's a big deal. You know, it is, it is a it's actually quite hard teaching photography now, it seems, um, uh, because it's uh, there are so many. Uh, different um, historical paths that um, that students learn about or 
and I actually it, it's like I went I went to Vancouver in 2015 I was saying for a sabbatical but I actually taught a part-time course at Emily Carr during that time and so there I was from you know Ottawa and I was in Vancouver and I had the second year course it was called uh, natural light or uh, available light right and so uh, I, and I was thinking god available light okay that means taking pictures because you got light you know <laughs> and so I thought it was like how do I what do I do with this course so I asked the students I said what would you like to do in this class what would you you know and they said we'd like to learn how to take pictures with a large format camera and go in the dark room <laughs> <laughs> and so I just said well isn't that great because I know how to do all that and we can do it and it was it was really hard to get them to open up the dark room again like you know the the technicians the, the and to um you know and so okay we're going to do actual pictures we're going to borrow four by five cameras and I taught them how to do that and they were so happy and I said so what is it that makes you so happy about doing this and they said well because you know, here in Vancouver, everything has to be conceptual. I just want to take a picture and make a picture. <laughs> I've seen these young people in 2015 still kind of like, you know, hung up by the history of photography in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Very important one, super, you know, all, you know. But um, so I, I think, I mean, analog is where they're going and and the mix is between what you can do with analog and and digital mm -hmm. uh their phones video you know using you know making film i mean um so so i think that um that's the way to go is to listen to what they want to do and to let them hmm. not not make them have a you know you have to have a reason you know, <laughs> because the, this has already been done in the history of photography. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It hasn't been done today and it hasn't been done by them. And it hasn't been done in this context. Yeah. So I think that that's really, I mean, that's how I would answer that question. Although maybe I went off on another idea, but no, I think that's a, a great way of putting it. Thank you. Um, We'll move on to another question. Uh, this one is, can you talk about your relationship to making books and multiples? Well, 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 yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I, from the very beginning, um, I, um, uh, I, I just sort of, um, it was the first thing I did. I had a little show at, at um, it was in, um, oh, Kingston, at the Agnes Etherington. And um, I had a friend who worked in a, in a press in, in Vancouver, and he printed it for me really well and designed it for nothing. And, you know, you get a little bit of money and you do something. And I, uh, that led one thing, after that, and it is so satisfying. I still think it's probably the most important thing you can do is mm. do the book. The, the history of photography and the history of the photography book, they're pretty much um, side by side. Um, and there's, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's a very rich subject. It's a very rich field now. There's a huge amount of photo publishing. When I started, I mean, I, there was, it was, you, you know, you had to go on, to get the book the Ache that Berenice Abbott did, you had to go to Wittenborn in New York and they might sell it to you if they liked you, you know. Um, yeah. so, so now you've got huge amount of um, information. Everyone's got too much information. My big advice is, if it's like practical advice, is <clears throat> sever your relationship to the screen. I, th I think, I think um, people, my teacher friends tell me that, you know, my, most students sit, you know, they sit in front of screens most of the time. They don't actually make that many pictures. And um, so one one trick, uh, well, you know, you know, he makes them makes them do a book, you know, sixty photographs and publish it, you know. And then you have to go out and make pictures, sequence them, you know, think about it. Um, it's but I think the screen is so seductive and so mm -hmm. time wasting. Um, the, the whole kind of the great existential pleasure of walking out and being alert and but passive um, and sense it just it's it's the best feeling you know and, and to, to to go to a new city walk out of the railway station delicious you know mm -hmm. I mean yeah yeah I, I travel too I think not for the exotic but um, I, I can't photograph anywhere 
exotic, you know, I, you know hopeless. Um, they say, oh, it's picturesque. No, no good. Photogenic, no. But I think it's just good for your for your mind, um, for your for your head. But, but but get away from the screen. I think that's good advice for everyone, for all of us, for sure. Um, and uh, Christos, maybe you can speak to this last question or any of you are welcome to jump, jump in, but does anyone feel any new barriers in photography like uh, permissions or consent? That is a, an interesting question. Um, certainly um, in street photography, that has really never been an issue. Um, that the street, uh, even in, uh, in cases, uh, in legal cases that have happened, um, uh, one is pretty well free to photograph uh, a street life. Although in Vancouver, for example, we have the downtown <clears throat> east side, which is what I call kind of like the cancer of our condition. And it's been going on for a long, 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 long time, way too long. And perhaps we have now a new government and civic government, and maybe something can happen here. So you have blocks and blocks and blocks of people who, of course, a lot of them have migrated here, where uh, there's all sorts of amenities here uh, for people who have all sorts of incredible social problems. We have poverty, we have people living on the street. So if I was to, for example, as an artist doing a public art project or anything that was sanctioned by the city of Vancouver, and I was to photograph that particular condition, it wouldn't be allowed. So now we have a kind of a self-censoring kind mm -hmm. of thing where mm -hmm. it's not allowed, you, you wouldn't, you're not allowed to do it and, and and it's a very odd kind of situation. I mean, if you are a photojournalist, of course, photojournalism um, uh, doesn't, doesn't wade into that particular problem. Um, so uh, asking permission for people, I mean, if Fred Herzog or if uh, Lorraine or if Jeffrey went up and somebody, you know, like that walking woman says, well, can I follow you for a while? Because I actually see a really great picture here. It would never happen, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, cre the creative moment would have never happened. Yeah. So uh, there's got to be, you know, there's got to be caution here. Uh, I, I know uh, 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 in many cases, uh, one has to have caution. In some cases, of course, you do need permission and you have to have reasons for, um, uh, as I did, you know, with my particular uh, project. So this is a kind of a, a new kind of fraught kind of territory, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. 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 It's Hastings, sorry. I, I once went down on, along Hastings, Chris was talking yeah. about, um, with, with Fred Herzog, you know, um, he wanted to show me. I, I didn't know something about it. And um, I, I had these rather fancy red spectacles. I thought they were stylish, you know. And um, the thing is, whether I asked permission or not, everyone see, see, saw me coming and say, hey, Elton. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Quite a I compliment. Could, maybe if I made friends with Gabor Mate and, you mm -hmm. know, what I say, it's, you'd have to be, it's very, very problematic, all that stuff. So, yeah, it, Quebec, strangely enough, where I've <clears throat> moved recently, um, there was a case in which the commercial use of a street photograph was sanctioned, it was not allowed. Uh, somebody sued because their picture had been used. That's another issue. Um, right. uh, and I, I know guys like Martin Parr, you know, he, he takes all kinds of cheeky pictures of people. He's always got someone with permissions, he, he doesn't. When I photographed the prison, I had to get everybody's signature. Any one photograph had to sign, but of course I couldn't do it while I was taking the pictures. The one moment you start doing that, you're negotiating. Oh Jesus! So, so what I did was I had to wait till it was over, and then the prison people, thank goodness, they found everybody. Some of them had left. It took months to get it, but I, mm -hmm. every single one was covered. You know? Wow! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Thank you all for your your insights, your advice. Um, and your stories. Uh, I think that's it for the questions and we will probably start to wrap some things up here. 
so thank you to all of the attendees for joining us. We'll be um, posting this video on our website on Tuesday. So you're welcome to um, revisit it and share it with friends. Uh, and thank you so much panelists for joining us. That was very insightful um, was and, and very happy to have this support our exhibition, The Street as well. So thank you all. Thank um, you. Have a great night. Yeah. Nice seeing everybody. Yeah.